Hi, this is Evan Beach again. I'm a research scientist at the Center for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering at Yale University. We're continuing with applying the principles of green chemistry with module two, using the principles to identify and define sustainable practices in science. In other words, figuring out what is and what isn't sustainable about much of the chemistry that we perform in the 21st century. In the first module, we explored why we're at a point where we need to consider sustainability in the chemical enterprise and how the 12 principles can be used to create and practice a more sustainable brand of chemistry. In this module, we're gonna use the principles to more precisely identify what is and what is not sustainable about a chemical or a chemical process. We'll do this by evaluating the inherent hazards at every stage of a chemical's life cycle. As we saw in the last module, the path to sustainability begins with a change in human behavior. An approach like this might seem like common sense, but change this fundamental is difficult, since green chemistry really means redesigning the entire tools of our trade. Change is never easy, but as we've already seen, it's clearly necessary. Remember what George Santayana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. As a powerful example, let's consider some of the most important chemists in history who died as a result of the chemistry they practiced. So Carl Scheele, who discovered oxygen and chlorine, died of exposure to hydrocyanic acid, arsenic, and heavy metals. Humphrey Davy, who discovered over one-fifth of the elements in the periodic table, died of exposure to nitrous oxide. Madame Curie, who discovered the element radium, died of leukemia induced by radiation. And Rosalind Franklin, co-discoverer of DNA's double helix, died of cancer, probably linked to high levels of X-ray exposure. None of these people were stupid or careless. They were just working within the context of their times, and within what experts understood then to be hazardous. Today, we should know better. After all, we now have a much better understanding of hazard. Yet most chemists and industries don't consider whether the products and processes they create and use are inherently safe and sustainable. Instead, the main criteria for a successful chemical are low cost and high performance. After all, businesses exist to make a profit, so if a chemical or a product can be manufactured at a reasonable cost, then the issues of sustainability simply don't come up. But measuring the real cost of a chemical process is tricky. We often spend huge sums of money and pour enormous effort into cleaning up after the mess we've made. Since 1981 in the U.S., for example, we've spent an average of $1.2 billion each year on Superfund cleanup sites. And this doesn't take into account the uncalculated billions in related healthcare costs. Could we have saved much of this money with a little planning up front? If we look at these issues through the lens of green chemistry's 12 principles, however, we gain a new perspective. How? First, we can use them to identify inherent hazards in a chemical's life cycle. Second, they can help us design solutions from the beginning that increase sustainability. But to create solutions, we first have to determine where the problems lie. This brings us back to looking closely at a chemical's entire life cycle which means looking at, first, the raw materials that make the chemicals possible, the manufacturing process that creates them, their distribution and use in the real world, and finally, what happens to them when their intended lives end. Let's start by addressing feedstocks. The first question we have to ask is, do the raw materials we use deplete limited resources? For example, a primary raw material used in chemistry is petroleum. Petroleum is not a renewable resource, at least not on a human time scale. If we're using the 12 principles to help us decide if this is the best sort of feedstock to use, the answer would be no. Instead, we would want to consider a renewable feedstock, probably some sort of biomass, starch, or plant byproducts, for example. Next, we need to examine the manufacturing process. There are lots of issues to consider in this phase, but the underlying goal is always the same, to design as much waste out of the process as possible. How? There are several ways. You can evaluate reaction efficiency, for example, and that's just another way of saying that you're working to make sure that all of the atoms in the material you start with 
end up in the final product. We can accomplish this by reducing or eliminating the need for solvents or other excess reagents, and by reducing energy consumption, or at least using renewable sources of energy. As we explore the chemical's life cycle further, the 12 principles can also be used to address any hazards inherent in the distribution and use of the chemical. Principle 12 states, substances and the form of a substance used in a chemical process should be chosen so as to minimize the potential for chemical accidents, including releases, explosions, and fires. Chemists must design chemicals and processes to address toxicity, explosiveness, and flammability. Keeping stockpiles of chemicals increases the likelihood of accidents, fires, or even terrorist attack. On the other hand, chemicals designed to be green from the very beginning take all of this into consideration and reduce the chances for trouble. Finally, let's consider disposal, the final phase of a chemical process's life cycle. Green principle number 10 summarizes how green chemists should think about disposal. Chemical products should be designed so that at the end of their function, they do not persist in the environment and break down into innocuous degradation products. So the questions a chemist should ask include, how will it impact the environment? Is it toxic? Do chemicals accumulate in the food chain? How persistent are they? Do they refuse to break down and build up through the environment as they move up the food chain until ultimately they accumulate in us? Often the answer is yes, but chemicals that are designed using the principles of green chemistry do far less damage to the environment. What is the take-home lesson we can draw from all of this? The 12 principles are a kind of toolkit we can use to identify problems throughout the chemical enterprise by looking at a chemical process's life cycle so that we can then develop solutions that eliminate those problems. In the next module, we'll explore exactly how we can use the principles to change the way we practice chemistry to create truly sustainable solutions and bring about the change we need.